Grace Point. Good morning to those watching online as well. I just want to invite you to stand and worship with us as we focus on the King of Kings and who he is and what he's done for us. Amen.
you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? All I 
desperate for you. Oh God, we need you, we need you, we need you. Oh, we need you, we need you. Oh, without you, God, we can do nothing, God. is my surrender here is where I lay it down every lie and every doubt this is my surrender this is my surrender here is where I lay it down every burden every crown this is my surrender this is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. Whoa! 
to do whatever you want to for dreams. Do whatever you want. Do whatever you want to. matter the cost, do whatever you want to. Oh, whatever it is, God. Whatever you want, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. To whoever you would have me talk to, God. Oh, I make room, God, I make room. I make room for you. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. Self away. I give myself away so you can use. I give myself away. I give myself away. Self away so you can you I give I give myself away I give myself away so you can you
You know, one thing I've learned um, going through difficulties and just waiting on the Lord is sometimes your breakthrough comes in a surrender. It comes in saying, it's hard. It's hard living for you. It's hard. And everything around you just wants you to cave to the pressure. And your victory is just saying, yes. Yes, God. I don't care what it costs me. It may cost me some friends. It may cost me family. It may cost me status. It may cost me this or that or the other. But my answer is still yes. And that's what he's waiting for. He's just waiting for a yes this morning.
Church, make that your cry. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not. I will build my. I will build my life upon your love. It is a is in this place he wants to answer all of our questions he wants to meet our needs he wants to show us his grace and his goodness I've been thinking a lot about this last week of the person by the name of Job the oldest book in the Old Testament and when God came to him at the end of all of his struggles all of his problems all of his difficulties all of his pain he responded finally to the Lord and he said this, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can ever be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? It was talking about himself. Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here now and I will speak, I will ask you and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. You see the Lord today? That was his response. That was his response. And God met him. God, the thing we just sang about I will trust in the Lord 
That's what he calls us to, to trust in him. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what difficulty, I don't think any of us can match Job, by the way. I think that he had more troubles than all of us put together. But uh, he is here to meet you today. So continue to open your heart up to him. He wants to talk to you. He wants to bless you. He wants to show you who he is. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you've opened our eyes. Thank you that you've opened our ears so that we might see you high and lifted up. Lord God, we might see you as the answer to all of our difficulties, all of our problems. Oh, Lord, it's too wonderful for us to imagine that you can do all things. There's nothing too difficult for you. You're the God that redeems. You're the God that saves. You're the God that restores. You're the God that heals. Oh, Lord God, you're the God that comes to bless us to lift us out of the doldrums and bring us into the glorious light and the revelation of Jesus Christ, your son. So we turn to you, we look to you, we trust in you, Lord, today, that you may be glorified continually in this place, in our lives individually and in our families. Lord, show yourself mighty. Lord, we need you. We need your touch. Oh, Lord, we need your truth. We need your very life itself to fill us. So come, come by your Holy Spirit. Move in our hearts continually so that you may be glorified in every aspect of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, if you love the Lord... The next thing it says, we need to love one another, so why don't we practice that? Turn and greet one another, bless one another, and uh, let the love of Jesus shine through you. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Grace Point, where it's our desire for you to encounter God, serve the world, and grow in community. I'm Edwin, the youth pastor here at the church, and we are so blessed to have you all joining us today. If this is your first time in the building, we would love to connect with you after service. Please find Pastor Floyd right outside of our welcome room, where we have a special gift just for you. We can also pray with you and answer any questions that you might have about the church. If you don't have a church that you can call home, then we invite you to be a part of what God is doing right here at Grace Point. If this is your first time watching online with us, we want to connect with you as well. Go ahead and text the word WELCOME to 845-210-9911. We will also appreciate you giving this video a like, a thumbs up, and a share. Just think about how easy it is for us to share the word of God. All you have to do is hit a few buttons. Even you guys here in the sanctuary can go to our Facebook page right now and share our live broadcast. You never know who will see it and have their lives be forever changed. Last Sunday, we got to celebrate the baptism of one of our young adults. It has been such a blessing to witness the work that the Lord is doing in this body. We'll be holding another baptism service on October 23rd. And if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you haven't gotten baptized yet, I want to encourage you to take the baptism class today, right after service. Just come up to the front of the sanctuary and have a seat right across from the baptism tank. Coming up this Friday, CareNet Pregnancy Center in Rockland will be hosting the annual fundraising banquet. So if you guys want to come and support CareNet, you can reserve your spot online by visiting the events page on our website or go and visit the CareNet table in the lobby after service. At the end of August, our youth went away for three days to the Mount Laurel Retreat Center, and I know that the Holy Spirit moved in a mighty way. Walls came down, friendships were built, and I can't stress how important it is for the youth to stay in fellowship with each other outside of the four walls of the church. It's our heart as a church for all of us to grow in community. Yes, we have youth group every Wednesday, but we also do activities outside of that to strengthen the relationship between the youth and the youth leaders. On Saturday, October 8th, Chosen Youth will be hosting an apple picking event at Barton Orchards. 
Parents, I want to encourage you to sign your teens up for this event. We're praying for a beautiful day and great fellowship. To register, just head over to the events page on our website. And if you'd like to stay up to date on what's happening in the youth ministry, you can follow at chosen.yth.ny on Instagram. And finally, on October 31st, G Kids will be holding their annual Fall Festival. We want to make this a really special day for the kids. So if you would like to be a part of it and host a treat table, please sign up ASAP by going online to our events page. As you can see, there are always tons of exciting things going on here at the church. If you want to stay connected with us throughout the week, then please follow at GracePointGF on Instagram. God bless you and enjoy the rest of the service. Praise God. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward as we prepare to continue to worship the Lord in our giving. <clears throat> um, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 16, it says, now there are a bunch of promises here. If you are faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? You know, the Bible tells us that God wants to entrust into our hands something that goes beyond what we see in the natural, something that goes beyond what we can do just with our own abilities and strength. And I do believe that tithing is connected to this principle here and also what the Lord wants to do in and through our lives. If, if we can be trustworthy and trust him in this area, I know that he can place other things into our hands and into our heart that he would be glorified through. The Bible continues to say, no one can serve two masters. For you'll hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Here we preach freedom in Christ Jesus and Part of that freedom is trusting God in the area of tithes and offerings. And so we want to encourage you this morning to not make a decision to put money in a basket or click a few buttons and give money. We want you to make a decision in your heart to trust the Lord, to trust the Lord in this area of your life. And let's walk with the Lord in honesty. The Bible says unless two agree, they can't walk together. And so we want to walk together with the Lord. A few ways you can give us as the ushers come around this morning. You can give online by going to our website, gracepointny.org, to the giving section, or begin electronic giving by texting GRACEPOINTGF to 77977. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege that you don't just care about our physical health, you don't just care about our families, you don't just care about the ministries that you want us to serve in, you don't just care about if we have a job or not, you, you actually care about our finances. Father, you care to make sure that we will be, make it all the way through the end with a tender and responsive heart to you. And so you set up a principle of tithing, Lord, that our hearts would be moldable and pliable in your hands. And so we trust you this morning, God. We know that you are an unfailing provider and a good father. And we pray that you would use these funds for your glory, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If it had not been for the goodness of God, I mean, you know, I grew up in the South Bronx. I grew up in a rough area where all my friends around me were getting involved in, in drugs and partying and just doing things they weren't supposed to do. And honestly, as a kid, that appealed to me. I sing because I know what God has done in my life. I know where I've come from. I know where I could have been. I know where I should have been. And so I sing today, um, not because I feel forced to, not because I feel mandated to, but because I know the goodness of God. I chose to follow him instead of following what the world was doing. And let me tell you, I, I don't regret one second. I love the fact that I chose God. And because of his goodness, um, I'm married, I have a kid, I have a wonderful job here at the church. And so, I'm so happy and glad that I made this decision to follow God and to taste and see that the Lord is good. That's his promise. My heart for First Tuesday is that uh, people would love to learn and long to spend time in his presence. I think today in our society, 
you know, where everything is quick. You, you go to fast food restaurant, you get food like this, you, you buy something on Amazon, you get it the next day. And my heart for First Tuesday is that we would learn as, as the people of God just to wait on Him. This First Tuesday on October 4th, I'm really excited about this night. This night, we're going to be hearing testimonies of the worship leaders that you've seen on stage every Sunday and every Tuesday. And they're going to be sharing a song that God has been ministering to them. And right after that, you're going to be hearing stories of where God has taken them from. And I believe that their stories are going to encourage and challenge us to trust in God who was faithful, who is faithful, and who will be faithful. Well, praise God. Praise God. We're looking forward to this coming Tuesday night, and I hope you'll be here with us. You got a little card, hopefully, coming through the doors. This is not just a reminder for you, but it's an invitation for somebody else. Maybe there's somebody uh, in your workplace, in your home. Invite them to be here uh, this Tuesday night. You're going to hear some powerful testimonies. I'm excited to share a word that the Lord has put on my heart, but it's just good to come together. Amen? and spend some time lingering in the presence of God. There is, is a lot going on. Uh, maybe you walked in today and you saw the shoe, shoe boxes out there in the lobby. That's Operation Christmas Child starting up again. Encourage you to grab one, but they're not for storage at home, so don't take it home and use it for storage, okay? If you're gonna take one, bring it back, all right? Uh, but a lot of good things happening. Our Tanzania missions team is back and they're gonna be sharing, <laughs> praise God. They're going to be sharing testimonies uh, next week. We want to give them a little time to get over that jet lag, and then next week you're going to hear uh, some amazing stories of what God is doing in Tanzania. But we're going to turn to the Word this morning. If you have your Bible, open up to Acts chapter 17. Let me pray one more time for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your Word. Lord God, I declare today, as we even sang, I'm not enough unless you come. So Holy Spirit, we pray in this moment that you would minister to us through your Word, Lord God. We don't want to just go through a routine today. We don't want to just walk in and walk out. But Lord, we pray that you would do something in our time together in your word that would mark us, that would change us, Lord God, for eternity. We declare even as we sang this morning, you have our yes, Lord God. We surrender our lives to you. So we just submit our, our time to you right now. Holy Spirit, come. Be our teacher. Be our guide. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 17, we're following the missionary journey of Paul the Apostle. Maybe get a little more light in the house. Hopefully you got a note sheet coming through the door. This is not a community group week this week, but I encourage you to still take notes because there may be questions next week on some of what I talk about today, okay? But I encourage you, grab that note sheet out and write some things down. As we jump into it, I want to take you to a map. Uh, we have a little map here uh, of Paul's second missionary journey. For those of you that like maps as much as I do, I don't know why, I just kind of geek out about maps. Uh, but we can see Paul's second missionary journey. This is what we've been following. Oh, and it just went away. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, we know that uh, starting in Antioch, Paul and Barnabas decide they're going to go back to these churches that they established. They're going to go back and encourage the believers. And we talked a few weeks ago about how there was this disagreement on whether they take uh, uh, John Mark with them, right? And so there's, there's a separation that happens in Barnabas takes John Mark, and he goes to Cyprus, and then Paul and Silas, they begin to travel up through Cilicia and Derb into Lystra, which is where uh, Paul was stoned, right, and dragged out of the city. They're going back there. And then they, as they continue to travel, we know this, that they're uh, seeking where the Lord would have them to go. They travel through Galatia. You can see that whole green area there. That is Galatia and Phrygia and then we're told they're prevented by the Holy Spirit from speaking the word in Asia. Now, this is not the Asia that we think of when we hear the word Asia. This is not China, Asia, okay? This is what's known as Asia Minor. Uh, and so they come into the region. You can see it there of Mysia up to the top area there. And uh, they think, why don't we go up to Bithynia, which is to the north, but again, the Holy Spirit does not allow them. And so they end up in Troas, and it's there where Paul sees a vision of a man from Macedonia calling him to come to Macedonia and help. And so they travel by boat. You can see that travel from there uh, to Neapolis, and then from there to Philippi. And last week, in the beginning of chapter 17, we saw they travel into Thessalonica, all right? So we're following their journey. 
And they get into Thessalonica, and, and right away, Paul goes where? Where does he go? He goes to the synagogue, okay? And verse 2 tells us that he reasoned with them from the Scripture. Listen, I love this. You're going to find that word a lot with Paul, especially in this chapter. He reasoned with them from Scripture. Can I just say today the Christian faith is a reasonable faith? Paul never walked into the synagogue and said, you know, let me tell you guys how I feel about Jesus, right? Let me give you my opinion about Jesus, right? You know, in this internet age that we live in, doesn't it seem like everybody has an opinion about absolutely everything, right? Everyone's an expert because everyone watches YouTube, so I know, right, right? Even regarding Jesus, like if you post a topic of who he is on Facebook or Instagram, everybody's got an opinion, and sometimes that opinion, let's be honest, it comes out of left field, right? You talk about heaven or hell, you'll have people who say, well, I I don't believe in hell, right? I I don't believe that a loving God could send anyone to hell. And then you can question them and say, well, now when you say that, what's that based on? Well, I just don't think so. So no evidence? No, I I just don't believe that. Well, I, I don't believe that about God. And sadly, in our culture, that's enough. It's enough to believe anything about anything. People will say, well, well, I want to believe that, and that's good enough for me. I choose to believe that. That's my truth. Listen, there is no my truth, and there is no your truth. There's truth, and everything else is a lie. Remember when Pilate asked Jesus what is truth, what did he say? I am the truth, right? And, And so Paul goes into the synagogue, and he reasons with them from the scripture. Because if these Jews are going to come to faith in Jesus, he wants it to be founded on the word of God. He wants it to be founded on the authority of God's word and not just his opinion about who Jesus is. And sadly for too many, even in the church today, I think too many of their faith is based not upon God's word. Maybe it's based upon an experience they had or their feelings in regards to who Jesus is, right? Maybe someone told them something about Jesus and they believed it, but they never searched the word of God for themselves. And so you'll hear people say, well, doesn't it say in the Bible, like somewhere, right? Like, God helps those who help themselves. I'm like, no, the scriptures says the opposite. God helped those who could not help themselves, right? And so, so often people will say, well, doesn't it say that somewhere? Listen to me today. If your faith is simply based on your feelings, that's a problem. Because feelings can change and opinions can change. And if my relationship with Jesus is based on how I feel, I just really feel that Jesus is real, well, what happens when life gets turned on its head and all of a sudden you don't feel that way anymore. I'll tell you what, you will change your belief based on your feelings. Listen, if you only believe what your pastor tells you, but you never look it up for yourself and you never spend time in the word yourself, that's a problem. Because later on someone's gonna come to you or maybe they'll, they'll knock on your door and they'll say something else and you might say, well, that sounds more believable and now I believe that and you'll be tossed to and fro, why? Because you don't have a foundation that's in the word of God. And so Paul reasons with them from the scripture about Jesus. He takes them back to the prophecies of scripture and he says, look, I want you to see how these all point to the Messiah. And look at what he talks about with them here, these Jews, it says, he explains that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer. Now, why would Paul be talking about this with the Jews? Don't they know this about their Messiah? Well, here's the thing. The Jews had this propensity to look at the prophecies of Scripture and only focus on what they wanted to focus on. Does that sound familiar at all, right? Just give me the verse of the day. Just give me something to encourage me, right? It's human nature, isn't it, right? To just focus on what we want to focus on, okay? And, and, and the Jews, they, they struggled with this idea of a suffering servant, and they still do to this day. But Isaiah 53 tells us that the Messiah, that this suffering servant, that he would be despised, that he would be rejected, that he would be a man of sorrows. Of course, we look at Isaiah 53, we do, right? And we say, man, this is one of the most powerful prophetic passages about the Messiah. And understand, it was written 700 years before the birth of Christ. And so the Jewish people had 700 years to look at this and and see that the Messiah would suffer, and yet Paul shows up in the synagogues, and he has to argue this truth, right? He has to say, look, guys, I want to show you it was prophesied that the Messiah would suffer, that he must suffer. But Isaiah 53 tells us not only that he suffers, but it tells us why he suffers. 
tells us that he was pierced. Think about this. This was 700 years before the birth of Christ. This was long before the Roman Empire was in existence, right? Crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet, and yet we're told he was pierced. Why? For our transgressions. He was wounded for our iniquities. The Lord lays on him, on this suffering servant, the iniquity of us all. And so the message from the prophet Isaiah is not only that Messiah is going to suffer, but he's going to suffer for you. So Paul goes in the synagogue and he begins to reason with the Jews. He wanted them to know not only what to believe, but why to believe it, right? And you would have to reason with the Jewish scholars in the synagogue in order to get them to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. It tells us here that some are persuaded, right? And, and some uh, devout Greeks, some leading women are persuaded. But the Jewish leaders, they're not persuaded, they're upset because they're losing their influence over others. And so they get the city into an uproar, and they cry out. Listen to these words. You heard them last week. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. They're saying, oh, we we heard about these guys. They've been everywhere, and they've been stirring things up, and now they're here too. And that's not meant to be a compliment. It's meant to be a dig. But boy, is that ever a compliment. I would love to hear that said about Grace Point. You know that church in Rockland that's turning the county upside down, that's turning the tri-state area upside down? But listen to me. When you think about those words, technically speaking, the language is wrong. Because when you have a biblical worldview, you will understand that we as Christians are not attempting to turn the world upside down. We're trying to turn the world right side up again. You see, the world was already turned upside down. Genesis chapter 3 gives us the story of sin entering the world, and at that point, creation is literally flipped on its head. You know, there's a big question that a lot of people wrestle with in our world today, and it's the question of suffering, right? Because people can't reconcile an upside-down world with a loving God. Have you ever been asked the question before? You know the question, right? If God's so good and God's so loving, then why do people suffer and why do people die? And here's the simple answer. God never intended for people to suffer, and he did not create us for death. Where does death come into the picture? It's not a creation. Scripture tells us in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth, and he looks at all that he created, and he said, it is good, right? And death is not good. So where did death come from? Listen, we invited death with our rebellion, with our sinful behavior. I mean, think about it. If God created death, man, what kind of God would he be, right? God is is a good God. He created us in his image and his likeness. He is the author of life, and without him there is no life. And he made us to be eternal beings. He didn't say, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create man, and I'm going to make him suffer, right? And then I'm going to make him die. No, again, we invited death with our rebellion. But now we understand that when Jesus comes and he dies on the cross, he even redeems death. Yes, death is not good. The the word of God refers to death as an enemy. In fact, it's the last enemy to be destroyed. And and so when they see these men are turning the world upside down, they're really not. Sin already turned the world upside down. And now you and I have the privilege to bring the message of the gospel. We have the privilege to bring the hope of Jesus and turn things right side up again. That's what the gospel does. That's the testimony of of those who have been truly saved. How many of you would say, man, when I came to Christ, my world was put right side up again? How many would say that? Come on, look around the room today, right? That's a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my prayer for each and every one of you this morning is that you would turn your world right side up again. My prayer for this church, man, is is, is that we would not be inoculated with a mild form of Christianity so as to be rendered immune from the real thing. I pray that God would make us radical. I pray you would make us radical. Listen, if you're going to live your life for Jesus, live sold out. If you're going to live your life for Jesus, go in, go radical. Just love people, man. Share with people. That's radical. Just live the loving, compassionate, authentic Christian life in your community. That's radical. That's right side up. And so they continue their complaint. They say they're, they're, they are acting against the decrees of Caesar, and they're saying there's another king, Jesus. Now, this accusation happens to be accurate. And it's eventually going to get the Christians in trouble. The persecution that's going to be so prevalent under Nero will in part be because Christians gave their allegiance to King Jesus rather than to King Caesar. 
When they were asked to say Caesar is Lord, the Christian wouldn't. And so picture this. The city of Thessalonica is going crazy, and that's where we pick it up in verse 10. We're finally to our text today. Chapter 17, verse 10. To Berea. On arriving there, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. As a result, many of them believed, as did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too. Agitating the crowds and stirring them up, the believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Paul and Silas, uh, I mean, sorry, Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. And so he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating for foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Oropagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Then Paul stood up in the meeting of the Oropagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Oropagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. May God bless the reading of his word today. And so picture this. Paul and Silas are sent to Berea, and, and, and right away they go about their normal strategy, right? They say, we're going to go into the synagogue. But our passage tells us something interesting about the Jews in Berea. Did you catch this? It says they were more noble than the Jews in Thessalonica. Two things that we see in the passage earned them this compliment. You want to write these down. Number one, they received the word with eagerness. When Paul spoke, they, they were ready to receive what he was saying. Number two, they examined the scriptures to see if these things were so. And so the Bereans hear the teaching of the great apostle Paul. I'm sure his teaching was convincing. I'm sure it came with authority and power. And yet they would not just accept Paul's teaching before checking it out themselves. They want to know, man, are these things really true? I got to see it for myself, right? And I don't think this was like a casual searching of scriptures. I don't think, they, oh, there's that verse that he referenced. No, they're examining the scripture. They're they're examining the word of God. It was worth it to them to put in the hard work and really investigate what God's word says and see, man, does Paul's teaching actually line up? And here's what their study showed, that they believed they could find truth in the scripture. To them, 
the scripture was not just this inspiring book. It was not just some great poetry. It was not just a place you could find an encouraging verse to get you through the day. No, to them, scripture was a book of truth, and truth was there in the word of God to find. And the question is, what is God's word to you today? I'll tell you, your study of God's word says a lot about what you truly believe about God's word, right? But what I love about the Bereans is with all their study, with all this desire to know truth, they are by no means skeptics. Again, they receive the word with readiness. They receive it with eagerness. When Paul spoke, they had clear heads, but they also had open hearts. Many people that you talk to, you know, will say, I'm open-minded. I want to hear what you have to say, right? They're, they're ready to debate and they're ready to reason, but they're not, they don't have open hearts. <laughs> and so with all the study and with all the critique of things, they never receive the word with eagerness be, because we're told here that many of them therefore believed. And, and so Paul's speaking, and while he's speaking, these guys are fact-checking him, right? But I love it because Paul's not afraid. He said, go ahead, check the scripture. Look at it because I know that when you do, you'll see that what I'm saying is actually true. And, and they, they're going to come to find out what Paul said is true. That's exactly what happened. Unfortunately, this positive experience with the Bereans is, is short-lived because those envious Jewish leaders from Thessalonica, they follow them there. Okay? They're not satisfied enough to force Paul out of their own city. They travel 60 miles to disrupt his work in Berea as well. They stir up the crowds, and it's like, here we go again, right? It's, it's the same thing that happened in Pisidian Antioch. It's the same thing that happened in Iconium. It's the same thing that happened in Lystra and Thessalonica. This, this is the fifth city that Paul is run out of by an angry mob. Listen, when the gospel of Jesus Christ is clearly preached, you'll generally get one of two reactions. You'll either get repentance or you'll get a riot, right? I say preach the gospel, let's see what happens, right? But, but things get crazy, right? Because it says there immediately they send Paul off. It's almost like they fear for his life. We've got to get Paul out of the city. And so Paul goes, but Silas and Timothy remain, and they're investing in the believers there. And so they drop Paul off in Athens. And as the boat's leaving, he's like, uh, you know, tell Silas and Timothy to get here as soon as possible, right? And, and you get this sense almost that Paul is, is going to wait for his buddies before he begins ministry in Athens, but before they get there, he's compelled to speak. Understand, as Paul sails into the great Greek city of Athens, it's a city that's a few hundred years past its prime. I'm sure it's an impressive historic city, but as Paul walks around, he's a, a tourist of sorts, he's not impressed. No, Scripture tells us he is depressed because he sees a city that's full of idols. The Greek word that's used there actually means under idols or swamped by idols. It was said at this time it was easier to find an idol in Athens than it was to find a man. Like the idols outnumbered the people, right? And, and, and Paul doesn't say, man, look at all these cool statues, look at all these neat temples, right? He says, no, it's a shame because these statues and these temples, they, they just show me the failure of these religious systems to actually satisfy the heart. These systems can't take away people's sins. These systems are false religious systems. And so his heart is stirred. His heart is provoked, right? He, he sees a city that is given over to idols. I, I wonder what it's like for you when you go into a modern city of today, a city like New York City, right? I wonder what your response is inwardly because to me, New York is still pretty amazing. With all that's going on, it's still pretty amazing, right? And and you can go into Times Square and see all the lights. You can go see a Broadway show, and it's easy to just go, wow, this place is amazing. This place is great, right? But if you look a little bit deeper, you really don't have to look very far. There is a city that is looked over by millions of visitors that's often overlooked by millions of believers. And so picture this. Here's Paul in the great city of Athens, a city built by the best architects, the best sculptures, but all of this beauty of the city does not honor God, and so he's not impressed. Hear me today. Don't be too impressed by all the beauty and the charm of the world that does not honor God. Like, don't spend your life chasing after the things of this world. Remember, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? And so Paul's like, man, I can't wait for my buddies to arrive. <laughs> I'm waiting, but I can't wait any longer. And so he reasons, there's that word again, he reasons in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons. But check this out. He doesn't just stay in the synagogue. 
He also goes out to the marketplace. And he speaks day by day with those who happen to be there. Paul faces a new challenge in Athens because this is a cultured city. This is an educated city. This is a, a city that's proud of its history. This place is different than anywhere he's preached before. At this point, again, Athens is past its greatest days, but it's still described really as the intellectual capital of the Greco-Roman world. And so Paul encounters the philosophers. He encountered the, the, the Jews in the, in, the, in, the, in the synagogue, but now he encounters these philosophers in the marketplace. And it says there, there were Epicureans and Stoics. Do you know the difference between those? Let me tell you. Two different philosophies that were popular in that time. Okay? The Epicureans was a school of philosophical thought that was started by a man named Epicurus. Okay? Epicurus. He lived about 300 years before Christ. He came up with this philosophy, in short, that believed in randomness. He believed there was this pantheon of gods. There's so many different gods and goddesses, but really they have nothing to do with what happens in the real world. They believe, man, their activity has nothing to do with humanity on earth. They believe that life on earth came about by a random collision of particles. Does that sound familiar at all? Man, there's nothing new under the sun, right? And so they believe that when you die, well, nothing happens. And because of this, they saw the chief end of man as the absence of pain and the pursuit of pleasure. They would say, you only live once. (laughs) You gotta have all the good times you can. You gotta live a life that's full of pleasure because this is all you get and when you die, you're done. That was Epicureanism in a nutshell. They were those who pursued pleasure as the chief purpose of life. How many of you know an Epicurean today, right? How many of you are an Epicurean if you're honest, right? Now, there was also the Stoic philosophers, and if you hear that word, you kind of know what it means, right? The Stoics was this school of philosophy that was started by a man named Zeno, Z-E-N-O. He's a Greek philosopher, and Zeno was sort of like a New Age philosopher as far as he was very pantheistic. They believed in this pantheistic worldview that everything is God, right? The trees, you know, that's God, right? Similar to modern-day pantheism. Everything around you is essentially God. Mother Nature, Mother Earth, does that sound familiar? Again, there's nothing new under the sun, right? And so the Stoics, these philosophers, were different than the Epicureans. The Stoics believe that you need to endure all things, that you just need to keep an, a stiff upper lip. It's where we get that word Stoic from, right? They, they were very Stoic. And so the Epicureans believed you need to enjoy all things, and the Stoics said, well, you just need to endure all things. Now, These two worldviews are what Paul is confronted with here. And look at their response to the teaching of Paul. It's interesting. They call him a babbler. It comes from the Greek word for seed picker. This was an Athenian slang that referred to the birds that would fly around the marketplace picking up seeds. It was this idea of those who hung around the marketplace picking up little scraps of information here and there, but they had no clearly developed worldview or thought. They watched a lot of different things on YouTube, but it never really tied together, right? And, and they don't have an understanding of things of their own. Basically, they're calling Paul an undisciplined plagiarist. Now, the only thing more demeaning than this is their accusation that he was a proclaimer of foreign gods. But both of these accusations from the philosophers are so far from the truth. Paul was in no way a gatherer of different thoughts. His preaching had one central theme. If you look at it again and again, he sticks to the message of Jesus and his resurrection. That's what it says there in verse 18, right? He was preaching to them Jesus and the resurrection. You know, sometimes as Christians, we make the mistake of trying to out-intellectualize the intellectuals. We try to out-philosophize the philosophers, but Paul's not going to fall into that trap here. He knows that the cross is the power of God unto salvation. And, and so he's brought before the Oropagus. This is Mars Hill, okay? This is the, the same court that had tried and condemned Socrates to death centuries before. Now, they no longer have that kind of power. But what was it that brought Paul here? What was it that brought him to Mars Hill, it was kind of like the TED Talk of the day, man, to get the opportunity to speak on Mars Hill, right? It was the fact that his teaching was something new. And so they say, tell us more. We're a little intrigued. Like, we've never heard about this before. This is what got Paul an audience. Listen to how the people of Athens, though, are described here in verse 21. Look at this. It says, now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there 
would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. If that doesn't sound like our social media culture, I don't know what it is, right? Tell me something new, right? Tell me something new, right? Or let me tell you something new. That sounds exactly like our world today. But it was the novelty of Paul's message that earns him this invitation to speak at Mars Hill because these ancient Greeks, they love this constant, always changing stream of news and information. In the 19th century, Adam Clark, he was a man that lived in London, he described the, the situation of his day and it sounds a lot like our day. Listen to this, I think I have a quote there on the screens. He said this, this is a striking feature of the city of London in present day. The itch for news which generally argues a worldly, shallow, or unsettled, un- unsettled mind is wonderfully prevalent. Even ministers of the gospel, negligent of their sacred function, are become in this sense Athenians. So that the book of God is neither read nor studied with half the avidity and spirit as Instagram. I'm sorry, new, a newspaper. <laughs> it, it is no wonder if such become political preachers and their sermons be no better than husks for swines, to such hungry sheep look up and are not fed. Wow. What, what a powerful thought. That this itch to always have something new, it argues this unsettled mind. So much of our world today, right, is show me something new, tell me something new, check out this reel, right? You gotta see this, right? Entertain me because I'm bored. And I have to be honest, there is this temptation from week to week to get up to here and wow you with something new. Check this out, right? But my sacred function, my calling as a preacher of the word of God is to be in this word and to preach this word. Amen? And and your calling should be like the Bereans to say, I'm going to receive the word of God with all eagerness and then I'm going to examine the scriptures daily to see if what Pastor Dan says is actually true, right? Challenge me on it. Come on, get in the word and say, this doesn't make sense. Listen, We live in a day and age when we have access to so much information. Like you can get tons of sermons streamed right to your phone. Many preachers that are much more entertaining than me, right? Many of them much more charismatic. But I want to caution you today, church. Be very leery of preachers who don't open this book. Be very leery of preachers who don't open this book. Be leery of preachers who don't teach from the scripture but just give you their opinion about world events. Paul would always come and he would reason from Scripture. Now, here it's a little different because Paul doesn't begin with an outright exposition of Scripture, right? Which was his his, his custom when dealing with the Jews who were familiar with the Old Testament and said, Paul begins with this general reference to religion. He says, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Many in that time thought that the Athenians were the most religious people of all time. But I don't think Paul says this in a positive way. Because truth be told, if you trust in a false religion, that religion can actually lead you away from God, not to God, right? And so it's not always a good thing to say that people are very religious. He says here in verse 23, For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. The city of Athens was filled with these altars described to the unknown God. Why? Because the Greeks believed in many gods. And they also believed these gods were very fickle, and so we have to appease the gods all the time. And so they set up all these idols to all these gods, but there was this thought, what if we missed one of them, right? What if we miss one of these gods, and they show up one day, and they don't find their statue, or they don't find their temple? We better set one up just in case, and we say, oh, that's yours over there, right? The altar to the unknown God, right? And interestingly, I read this this week, about 600 years before Paul arrives in Athens, this plague came over the city of Athens. And and the thinking, of course, with the plague was, well, the gods must be angry, and so we need to appease the gods. And so a man by the name of Epimetides, he had this brilliant idea. I don't know if it was brilliant. It was an idea. He takes this huge flock of sheep, and he lets them loose in the city of Athens. And wherever they would lay down, they would sacrifice that sheep to the god that had the nearest shrine or the nearest temple. So if it laid down near the shrine of Zeus, that sheep goes to Zeus. Or Poseidon's shrine, that one goes to Poseidon or Hermes or Artemis or Athena or Aphrodite. Again, the gods just go on and on and on, right? But if a sheep laid down and it was nowhere near a shrine or a temple, they sacrificed that sheep to the unknown god and set up an altar to the unknown god. And so these altars, they were actually everywhere. 
And Paul says, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Are you thankful for that today? He doesn't dwell in some temple that we got to go to. We now are the temple of the Holy Ghost. But look at this is where he begins. Paul begins with their culture. Verse 24, now notice what he does. He, he begins with God. And he works his way down to man. Now, I want you to watch this. He begins with God, and he works his way down to man. Greek philosophy did the exact opposite. They began with man, and they worked their way up to God, right? That was their worldview. If there was a slogan for the Athenians, it would be this. It's all about man. It's all about mankind, right? But Paul's slogan, he says right away, I want you guys to know it's all about God. He begins with God and he works his way down to man. He tells them, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. He says, God doesn't need anything, come on. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And so he begins, God is the creator. And then he says, God's the sustainer. In verse 26, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on. All, 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 all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling. Why were you born here or why do you live here in New York right now? Because God wants you here, right? He's determined that the boundaries of your habitation, verse 27, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he's actually not far from each one of us. You need to know that today. He's actually not far from each one of us. Now he says, God is the ruler, God's the creator, God's the sustainer. He's the ruler of all things. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Paul's quoting some of the major poets and the the philosophers of the day. What does it show us? He was very well read, right? He he has a working knowledge of, of philosophy. It's in his head. It's in his heart, this working knowledge of Greek philosophy. He's able to stand there in Athens at Mars Hill and quote two Greek poets just off the top of his head. Now, again, he wouldn't do this in the synagogue. In the synagogue, I'm quoting the Old Testament, right? But here he's quoting them. And he's reaching people on their level. He's quoting to them their own poets. It's a good strategy for us when we're sharing with an unbelieving world, right? We ought to know what the unbelieving world is thinking and and reading and listening to. We need to understand that to some degree. Now look at verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. He's saying... Since we're his offspring, we are responsible to have the right ideas about God. And therefore, we need to reject the wrong idea that gold or silver or stone could represent God. The Athenians acknowledged in their altar inscription that they're ignorant about God, but Paul has been given evidence of their ignorance. But now he calls them to repentance. Look at verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now... He commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And so Paul goes from knowing who God is, he's our creator, to knowing who we are. We are his offspring. And so follow this logic. If God's our creator and we're his offspring, then we have a responsibility to him, right? We have a responsibility to know him and to understand him and to worship him in truth, right? And I want you to notice that Paul, he goes to Athens. He goes to this, you know, great philosophical center. I mean, the flow of culture. But he doesn't go there and preach a watered-down gospel. Like, even in Athens, even in this godless culture, he, he boldly confronted wrong ideas about God, and he speaks to this idea of a coming judgment. Now, to be honest with you, I don't know if that's where I would start, (laughs) that Jesus is a judge. But Paul refers to Jesus, and and his first mention of Jesus is that Jesus is a righteous judge. And and I honestly don't think Paul wanted to leave the Athenians with this idea that that Jesus is only a righteous judge. I, I think he stopped short before he could tell them everything he wanted to tell them about Jesus, but he gets this in, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. 
The emphasis on the resurrection is so important to Paul and it should be important to us today. Why? Because it shows that Jesus, it shows that his teaching, it shows that his work was all approved by the Father. Paul would never preach a sermon without focusing on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because honestly to Paul, the Christian life doesn't even make sense without the triumph of Jesus over the grave, right? The Christian life doesn't even make sense without the resurrection. But notice the response to Paul's message as we close, as we prepare to move to a time of communion today. I want you to see the response here. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, it says that some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again on this. And so Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed. Among them were Dionysus, the Arapagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. There were three responses that day to Paul's message. Rejection, reflection, and reception. Some rejected. Some thought about it, and they, they, they just said, wow, that's crazy, right? There were others that said, you know what, I need to think about this a little bit more. I want to hear you some more on this. But Scripture also tells us some received. Dionysus the Arapagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. There are those who argue, when you look at this passage, and you can go through the commentaries, that argue and say, well, Paul wasn't very effective in Athens because he didn't preach the cross. Well, earlier he was. But I think he was going to here as well. I think that's where he was going with his message. But I think the response was due to the attitude of the Athenians more than anything else. Some don't agree, but I would say that Paul was a success in Athens. And I still marvel at, at the Apostle Paul, who knew that the gospel was not just for Jerusalem, it was not just for Galatia, it wasn't just for Rome, but it was for Athens as well. And he had the boldness, and I pray that you have the boldness, to preach the gospel in the cultural epicenter of the world. To me, New York City is modern-day Athens. It's the cultural center of the world. And God's placed us here, church, for a reason. And we can't just keep silent and say, well, I don't know how to out-intellectualize the intellectuals. I don't know how to out-philosophize the philosophers. You don't need to do that. You just need to preach the message of the cross. You need to tell of Jesus. You need to tell of his resurrection. And understand this today. The results are up to God. The next place that Paul's going to go is Corinth. And I don't know if he was dis discouraged by the response in Athens. Maybe he felt like, man, this is my big shot, and I, I kind of blew it because there's only a few people that responded. But listen to how, what he writes in his letter to the Corinthian church later on. He says this, And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. How often we think we need that, right? He says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Would you stand with me today? Church, I believe this, that God has placed us right here for such a time as this. He's determined how long we should live and he's determined where we should live. And he wants to use our life. And, and so I just want to encourage you today. Don't be discouraged when you speak the truth of the gospel and some might laugh at you. Some might reject you. Some might ignore you. Of course, each one of us, we should prayerfully plan and, and choose our words just as Paul did in Athens. Of course, we should prayerfully, we should carefully seek to know and understand the culture that we live in. And we should preach boldly, whether it's to an audience of one or few or many. But in the end, I want to tell you, if you are faithful and obedient to your witness, if you prayerfully, carefully tell the good news, then how people respond is up to the Lord. And so I would just say this week, preach it anyway. Preach it anyway. As we come to the communion table today, we remember what Christ has done for us. Amen. We remember today that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer. We remember today that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was wounded for our iniquities. And you can reject this message today. You can reflect on it and just say, I need to understand more, Pastor. Or you can receive this message today. 
But can I just say, the decision you make in regards to Jesus is the most important decision you will ever make. Because as Paul said, he commands all people everywhere to repent. It's funny, because when we hear that word repent, we sometimes think of a, a fiery preacher on a street corner, right? Maybe he's got the sandwich board on, right? Repent, repent, repent. But I want you to understand today, church, repentance is an invitation. It's an invitation to the table. It's an invitation to say, you don't have to live that way any longer. You you don't have to continue to go down that path. It's an invitation to see your life today flipped right side up again. But it's so important that you also know this, that God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, his name is Jesus, whom he has appointed. That's who we remember as we come to the communion table today. By what he did on the cross, let me say this, by what he did on the cross, you can be saved today. Today is a day of salvation. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your Savior, I want to say you can do that right now. I'll say the same thing that Paul said to a Philippian jailer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. As we prepare our hearts for communion, you can do that right now heads bowed around this room you can in this moment simply acknowledge what Jesus did on the cross you can place your faith in that finished work and when we receive these elements in just a few moments can I just say it'll be more than a ritual it'll be more than a routine it'll be a true remembrance of what Christ has done for you so as we prepare to come to the communion table I want you to do business with God in whatever way you got to do that today If it's for the first time surrendering your life to God, you go ahead and you do that. You make that peace with God. Maybe today there's some who would say, well, I need to come back. My life is not lining up with what God's called me to, and so I'm repenting today. I'm turning whatever it is. Let's do business with God before we come to the communion table, before we receive the cup, before we receive the bread. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As you take the bread today and you hold that in your hands, it is a symbol of Christ's body which was broken for us. I want to read to you from Isaiah chapter 53. 
this is describing the suffering servant Jesus. It says he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and he's carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds were healed. Understand today, as you hold the bread today, that was a prophecy 700 years before Christ even came, that he would come and that he would suffer. It's by his wounds today that we're healed. Understand today the greatest healing we need is not a physical healing, it's a spiritual healing. And as Christ went to that cross, he paid the penalty for our sin. He allowed his body to be broken so that you and I could be made whole. As you hold the bread today, just give him thanks. Come on, begin to thank him for what he's done for you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Lord God. You're worthy, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you that as we hold the bread today, Lord God, you call us to do this in remembrance of you, and we need to be reminded, Lord God. We need to be reminded of the the cost of sin, of the, the penalty of sin. Lord, we need to be reminded that you bore that penalty for us so that we could know forgiveness. Lord, I thank you today that as we hold the bread, we can say that we've been made whole, Lord God, that our Our worlds have been turned right side up again because of what you did on the cross. And so we thank you today as we hold the bread for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We give you thanks. Scripture says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive with grateful hearts. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As you hold the cup today, it's a symbol of Christ's shed blood. Scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There's no forgiveness of sins. So again and again, the Jewish people would go into the temple and they would make sacrifice. The blood of the sheep would be shed, it would be spilled, but it was never enough to last. But then Jesus came. He's the Lamb of God, Scripture says, who takes away the sins of the world. When Jesus hung on that cross and his blood was shed for you, he paid for your sin and my sin, past, present, and yes, future. And so as we hold the cup today, we recognize this. Not only are we forgiven, but we're free from shame. We're free from shame. We don't have to walk around today uh, shameful of our past. We can be forgiven. We can know a right relationship with God because Jesus' blood was spilled for us. As you hold the cup today, give him thanks. Give him thanks today for forgiveness. Give him thanks today that shame is gone. Amen. Amen. Shame is gone in Jesus' name. We're set free because of what he's done. And so, Lord, we do thank you for the cup today. We thank you, Lord God, for your shed blood upon that cross. Lord God, we recognize, Lord, there's nothing else that can wash away our sin but the blood of Jesus. And so we thank you today that we're washed. We thank you today that we're forgiven. We thank you today, Lord God, that our worlds have been turned right side up and Lord, you desire to use us this week to proclaim that. And so even as we hold the cup and we proclaim this, Lord God, we don't want to just do that in this place. Lord, we want to do that in our homes. We want to do that in our workplaces, wherever you would take us. Scripture says in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread, and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's receive with thankful hearts. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, give him thanks this morning. Proclaiming the Lord's death, but don't miss that last part, until he comes again. He's coming back again. He's coming back as a a righteous judge, 
And listen, we can get excited about this this week, and we ought to. But we also declare to somebody that Jesus is coming back. Let me tell you who he is. Open your mouth this week, church. Be bold. In our Athens, let's declare who Jesus is. Amen? And leave the results up to the Holy Spirit. Let him use you this week in a powerful, powerful way. Let's sing. Let's worship before we leave this place. Let's lift our voices one more time. Give him thanks. this morning? Is it powerful enough to get you through the week, to empower you to preach the gospel unashamed? Hallelujah. So encourage one another before you leave. You also want to remind you that this coming Tuesday is our first Tuesday. So make an effort to be there, but also make an effort to invite someone. Amen. Holly, God bless you, and we'll see you on Tuesday and next week, Sunday.